Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the Friends of the Semmel Institute's first virtual open mind program with Dr. Gary Small, Professor of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA, the Director of the Longevity Institute, and world-renowned author, who's going to speak to us this afternoon about his new book, The Small Guide to Alzheimer's Disease, which he co-wrote with Gigi Borgen. When we founded the Friends in late 2004, it began with a small gathering of people in our family's living room. And our first open mind speaker that evening was Dr. Gary Small. He had just written his book, The Memory Bible. Now, fast forward 14 and a half years later, as we pivot to to the coronavirus era and guidelines to socially distance. Here we are with our first virtual program. And once again, we are so honored that Dr. Gary Small is our inaugural speaker. And over 500 people are tuning in to this program. In just a short time, our lives have changed dramatically. And this pandemic has challenged us all in different ways to cope, adapt, and grow. It has also shown us how important our social connections and collaborations are, and the importance of shared community. So we at the Friends of Semmel are very honored to be collaborating with the UCLA Longevity Center and Dr. Small and his wonderful team and with the amazing technology team from the Semmel Institute, Jason Lee and Boston Chu. And Jason is here in the wings in case we run into any technological difficulties because we are all new to Zoom. So, and also I wanna thank our wonderful Wendy Kelman who has helped us to qu quickly pivot to this online version of our Open Mind programs that bring together thought leaders in science and culture to present programs about mental health issues as a free public service to the community. We hope that by joining today's Zoom event, you will have the opportunity to learn and grow and feel socially connected, even though we are physically apart. Now, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Gary Small. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy, for that lovely introduction. I'm really excited to be here for the first online open mind. And uh, I am very excited to be able to talk about my new book, The, uh, the Small Guide to Alzheimer's Disease. Now, I'm going to thank a few people, but the first person I want to thank is my wife and co-author, Gigi Borgen. And in fact, this is the 10th book that Gigi and I have written together, and it's the second in our series of small guides. So what we're going to be doing this afternoon is spending a bit of time looking at Alzheimer's disease, discussing it. I'll talk for about 35 to 40 minutes. Then I will try to answer your questions. I do have some questions in advance, but you can also use the chat function on Zoom to propose questions as I go through the material. I would like to thank the friends of the Semmel Institute, the Longevity Center staff and board for their support, all of you out there who took the time to listen in. And I think it's going to be a worthwhile event. Now, in addition to all that, I'd like to thank the many funding agencies that have supported the research that I'm gonna be talking about, our many research volunteers, uh, many collaborators, and uh, also acknowledge some of my potential conflicts of interest. Now, this is a challenging time. With the uncertainty of what's going on, it's natural to experience anxiety and other uncomfortable feelings. And that makes dealing with Alzheimer's disease even more difficult. So I wanted to begin by sharing a few strategies that I think 
could be helpful in reducing some of the mind health risks we all face during this pandemic crisis. I think the first thing is to stay informed about public health updates. Knowing true threats can actually lower your anxiety. But if you spend too much time watching the news, it can increase your anxiety level. So try to take breaks from watching news all day long. Sheltering, sheltering in place can lead to isolation and loneliness. So use your technology to reach out to people outside the home so you can stay in touch with friends and family members and not feel so isolated. Now, many of us are fortunate to be able to shelter in place with loved ones, but even people we love can sometimes drive us crazy. So try to nurture those relationships, listen, remain empathic, but if something bothers you, talk about it without attacking and getting defensive. I think your relationships at home will also benefit if you spend some time alone each day so you can reflect, meditate, or do whatever helps to lower your tension. Also, try to stay mentally active to bolster your mood and cognitive abilities, playing games, doing anything that's fun and interactive. In fact, Gigi and I, we've been playing hearts with another couple online where we have a Zoom call and we use our cell phones uh, for our card hands, and it's a lot of fun. Try to create and stick to a daily routine. So if you're working from home, get up at the usual time, take breaks for lunch, for leisure activities, and definitely to exercise. Very important for adequate mind health. Eat a, a healthy diet, get enough sleep at night, and I think this will go a long way to reducing your stress. And those of you who haven't meditated, I recommend you try it. There are free apps for meditation at UCLA Mark, just search UCLA Mark online, or there are many apps, app uh, opportunities for getting guided meditation. And then finally, if the anxiety, fear, and stress is getting out of hand for you, don't hesitate to reach out for professional help if you need it. Most of us in the mental health field have already transitioned to virtual therapy. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease and begin with this question, what is it? In 1906, Aloise Alzheimer described the first case in a 51-year-old woman who became confused, she became psychotic, and it was a very aggressive illness. After four years, she died. And what Alzheimer did that was new was to apply special stains to her brain tissue after autopsy. And this is what he saw. He saw these amyloid plaques and tau tangles that collected in areas of the brain that control thinking and memory. The medical community thought it was interesting, but didn't take much note of it because they assumed that it was only occurring in people who were in their mid-50s, a rare pre-senile dementia. But in the late 1960s, scientists published a paper of a series of autopsy studies on people who had what we used to call senility. We used to assume that when you got old, you just got senile. That was a normal part of aging. Well, when they looked inside their brains, they saw the same plaques and tangles that Alzheimer described many years earlier. Now, this freaked people out because all of a sudden, we now had an epidemic of late life senility, or now we called it late life Alzheimer's disease. But the positive thing was that it forced scientists and doctors to look for better ways to diagnose it and treat it. But we do have this epidemic and age is the greatest single risk factor for developing the disease. 10% of people who are 65 or older will get Alzheimer's dementia. And by age 85 or older, that risk approaches 50%, and it costs us hundreds of billions of dollars each year just in the United States, if you look at both direct and indirect costs. So what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And I think this is a, a question that people frequently ask, and there's a lot of misinformation about it. I've had families come to see me for consultations, and they say, well, Dr. Small, thank God, 
the last doctor said it wasn't Alzheimer's disease, it was only dementia. And so, you know, I scratch my head when I hear that, and then I try to explain what these terms actually mean. So dementia is a cognitive loss, it can be a memory loss or impaired thinking, and that cognitive loss has to be severe enough that it interferes with the person's daily life. So that means the person is no longer independent, and lots of things can cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause. It has a gradual onset and progression, and you see these plaques and tangles in brain areas controlling memory and thinking. And of the cases of dementia, we see about 65 to 70% are due to Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you look at an Alzheimer brain, you see that it's shrunken or atrophied compared to a normal brain. And you see those insets demonstrating the high concentrations of plaques and tangles in areas like the frontal lobe, the thinking brain, or the temporal lobe uh, underneath the temples where we have some important memory centers. But notice that healthy brain and the insets there, you see an occasional plaque and an occasional tangle. And it turns out that these abnormal protein deposits build up in our brains over a lifetime. We've studied it with PET scanning. This is, these are some PET scan images that were taken from the PET scan that we developed at UCLA called FDDNP. And you see three-dimensional surface projections. And the redder and yellower the brain gets, the more plaque and tangle. And you can see as the animation begins, the memory score is quite low and then builds up with the plaque and tangle buildup. And we can see these abnormalities on the scan years, even decades, before people have obvious symptoms. Now, Alzheimer's disease is not just about plaques and tangles. And in fact, there's some debate, debate about whether they're a cause or an effect. And there are other abnormalities going on in the brain. I think one of the big problems is that we have heightened inflammation. Now, inflammation is a normal physiological process. If you sprain an ankle or if you have an infection, uh, your body repairs the damaged tissue or fights off the bacterium or the virus with this normal physiological response. Unfortunately, as we age, we tend to have too much inflammation in many organs of the body, and particularly the brain, and that's associated with cognitive impairment. So I'm going to be talking about some of the anti-inflammatory strategies that we can engage in to fight brain inflammation and protect our cognitive health, such as getting a good night's sleep, consuming omega-3 fats from fish or nuts, or even physical exercise. I know when I get a good workout, I have fewer aches and pains. And that's from the anti-inflammatory response of exercise. This slide demonstrates how the brain ages gradually. Uh, you don't get dementia overnight. It's a very gradual process, which makes it quite confusing both for doctors and the general public. And if you plot memory ability on the vertical axis versus increasing age on the horizontal axis, you can see that the, there are these three different stages that we often talk about. Normal aging is what we tend to joke about, the, the occasional forgetfulness or misplacing of objects. And it really is not a reason for concern. It tends to be stable over time. But for many people as they age, it will worsen into what we call mild cognitive impairment or MCI. Here the memory slips are greater. People tend to lose their train of thought. They get more insecure about their memory issues, but they are still able to compensate for them. And so they can remain independent. When that compensation process breaks down, that's when they get dementia, where there's more severe memory loss and they need help from others. Another common question people ask, is it normal aging or something worse? With normal aging, we see these four very common complaints, forgetting names and faces, misplacing things, the, what we call the tip of the tongue phenomenon. You know a word or a name, but it just doesn't roll off the tip of your tongue. 
or prospective memory breaks down. You forget plans and meetings. That's normal and in the book and in many, many of the courses we teach, we have ways to compensate for these problems. So what's abnormal? What's confusing is that you do see some of the same problems. You see memory loss, although it will be worse. Uh, people still misplace things, but it will be more severe. There are still word finding problems, but it gets more severe. But when people develop dementia, they not only become disoriented, but they get lost more frequently. They have trouble reasoning and thinking things through. You can see changes in mood and personality, and they have trouble completing familiar tasks like cooking or cleaning. Now, I mentioned that dementia can be caused from many different things. And, and this just gives you some examples of some of the conditions that can lead to cognitive impairment. People can get pneumonia or heart failure or a thyroid imbalance or an infection or vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. And these can present as a dementia, as well as many other medical conditions. Medications often cause confusion. So a lot of people take sedatives or hypnotics to help them sleep. And especially as you get older, it can cause cognitive impairment. A lot of people aren't aware that some of these over-the-counter sleep medicines have ingredients that can worsen memory, as can antihist some antihistamines, not all but medicines like Benadryl, which some people will take to help them sleep, can worsen memory. And certainly a number of different pain medicines can cause problems. In addition to Alzheimer's disease, there are other neurodegenerative illnesses that have no cure, like Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, or normal pressure hydrocephalus. When you go to the doctor, the doctor will look for uh, differences among these conditions and do some tests to differentiate them because it will have implications for therapy. So for example, frontal temporal dementia, uh, it tends to present not so much with memory problems, but uh, there may be problems with personality or with language skills. Uh, depression is a common problem that sometimes can look like dementia and we sometimes call it pseudo-dementia and treating the underlying depression can help with the cognitive impairment. And of course, alcohol, drugs, head injury, these are all conditions to consider. Uh, this is why it's important, if you have a concern about your memory, about your cognitive functioning, check with your doctor, because not only could it be something like Alzheimer's, but it could be a medical condition. And the other point I'll make in a moment is that it's important to diagnose these problems earlier. The earlier we get to it, the better the outcome. When I started out in this field, we didn't have any genetic information on Alzheimer's. Now we have much more. There are rare families who have a genetic mutation where it actually causes the disease. And in these families, there's a pattern of inheritance where half of relatives get the disease and it tends to be at the same age in life. This is extremely rare, it's less than 1% of cases, doesn't affect most of us. And if you're in a family like this, you may want to get genetic testing to find out what your status is. And certainly you should discuss the pros and cons of genetic testing with your doctor. And if it seems reasonable, you'll be referred to a clinical geneticist. Now for most of us, that's not the situation. There are not genetic causes or mutations, there are genetic risks. And the one genetic risk we know the most about is called APOE4, or apolipoprotein E4. 20% of the population, it, we are carriers of this genetic risk. It does uh, mean that we have a greater likelihood of getting the disease at a younger age, but it's not such a great risk that it's predictive. So we don't really like to use this test to predict the future of whether you're gonna get the disease or not. But we do use it in our research studies because it can be helpful in sorting out who might respond or not respond to a certain intervention according to their genetic profile. If you go to the doctor, uh, there will be some blood tests to see if you have one of these medical conditions. There'll be a physical exam. 
And the doctor will probably order an MRI or CT scan to determine if there is a space occupying lesion that could be causing problems like a tumor or a stroke. That is usually rare, but we do that to make sure that there isn't that underlying problem. A few years ago, actually our team at UCLA was very much involved with policymakers to get a change in the Medicare reimbursement policy. So in certain situations, Medicare will pay for a PET scan that looks at sugar in the brain or sugar metabolism in the brain called FDG PET. And you can see by these images on the slide that Alzheimer's disease or AD has a different pattern than FTD or frontal temporal dementia. I think the reason the policymakers agreed to that is that frontal temporal dementia does not respond the same to the anti-Alzheimer treatments that we have available. And in more recent years, uh, you know, I showed you some images from FDDMP scanning. There are other amyloid and tau scanning technologies with PET. Some of them have been FDA approved, but Medicare does not reimburse for them because it's not clear that getting one of these scans will change your outcome. So uh, generally, I'm very conservative about re recommending scans, even though I've been studying these kinds of scanning technologies for many years. I always ask myself, is this going to help the patient or am I gonna be wasting money by ordering this procedure? Now, if somebody has Alzheimer's disease and you put them on a placebo, as this slide demonstrates, uh, the person will get worse over time. We know this from many studies. There have been several medications that have been approved and developed over several decades that have what we call a symptomatic approach. And so you can see what that looks like by the blue line. There's, there's going to be temporary benefit, but there's not going to be a change in the slope of decline. So eventually people will get decline from even in spite of the fact that they're taking these medicines. And the other point on this slide is if people end treatment prematurely, they will decline more rapidly. The medicines you've heard about, they're advertised on television because we've had them for so long. Uh, Aricept or Dinepazil is a pill that people take once daily. Uh, it does have some side effects. Most people tolerate it, but there can be some upset stomach for some people, it can be a slow heart rate or dizziness. About 5% of people develop vivid dreams, but many times they can tolerate it. Uh, if people have trouble with the gastrointestinal side effects, we often will switch to Exelon or Rivastigmine patch, which doesn't, which sidesteps the stomach. And so people have fewer stomach problems when they take the patch. Once somebody is on uh, one of these first drugs, often Nemenda or Memantine is added, and we see additional benefits from that. There can be some side effects like fatigue, headaches, dizziness or weight gain, but for the majority of people, they tend to tolerate these medications. And why take them? Because multiple studies have shown that you get some stabilization of the disease. You, you remain at a higher level longer as a result of them. Some people do have some possible uh, temporary improvement. You have less emergence of behavioral disturbances with these medications. Patients remain on a higher level of functioning, and there's a lower caregiver burden as a result. But again, I want to just point out uh, what it looks like if you compare a placebo response to a treatment response, and you notice that there's a decline at the end point. That's when everybody was taken off of medicine. So if you stop the medicine prematurely, there will be a more rapid decline. It's something to discuss with your doctor if you're noticing some gradual decline on the medicine, talk with your doctor. It may be possible to increase the dose, uh, or uh, you may want to stay on it a bit longer. Caregiver burden is really a very difficult challenge. Uh, this is an illness that affects not just the patient, but caregivers. And this has touched many of our lives. You know, either you're going to be a caregiver or you're going to have to receive caregiving. And none of us really want to experience that. It's a full-time job. And the caregivers experience 
more physical problems. They go to the doctor more, uh, they, they take more medicines, they're more likely to be hospitalized themselves. And some studies have shown that it actually worsens their immune function. And that's something we're all concerned about in this day and age of the coronavirus pandemic. When I see caregivers come into my office, I'm thinking about depression because I know that at least half of primary caregivers of dementia patients get depressed. And depression is a treatable illness that we need to address. In our book, Gigi and I spend some time talking about the emotional roller coaster of caregiving. And uh, we look at it as having five stages, much like Kubler Ross has described stages of grief, where people initially go into denial, they have emotional turmoil, a lot of them will try to chase a cure and go after unfounded treatments. At, at a certain stage, they start grieving the loss of that patient. It's very confusing because the person is there still physically, but emotionally, they're not there. Their personality gradually drifts away and it's heartbreaking. But eventually, if they go through these processes, there's acceptance and resolve. But it's important for caregivers to take care of their own needs. It's not good to do it alone. It, it takes a village to deal with this. And it's important to have realistic expectations about the disease, that even though you may solve one problem, there's going to be another problem down the road because the disease continually progresses. And there are a lot of other caregiver challenges I'm not going to have time to get into today. You know, big one is taking away the car keys. Uh, I can refer you to the Longevity Center. Uh, uh, my colleague, Linda Erkeley, did a, a wonderful uh, workshop on that, and we have it posted online. Uh, we talk about finances and the challenges there. I mean, the financial issues uh, break up many families. Uh, what do you do when you want to hire help and get help? Different kinds of living options. That's a big challenge right now with the pandemic, and people are very concerned about their elder uh, elders, even if they don't have dementia, living in long-term care facilities. Uh, but I think the new technology is an option, something else we address that can really help people make a difference. So there are a lot of technology, technologies out there, home monitors for appliances, lights, cameras, wearable GPS tracking devices. You can get phones that are easy for a senior to use. You can use video conferencing to stay connected to relatives. You can have a pizza party, party with your relative by using video conferencing, uh, medication dispensers. And I also wanted to point out hearing aids because you know, it's so common to lose your hearing as you age and that contributes to cognitive impairment because you're not getting the input. You, you can't remember things if you don't get the information to begin with. There's a lot of research going on. We're doing it at UCLA. They're doing it around the world. Uh, a lot of the research is focused on clearing out those plaques and tangles from the brain. And they've used medications, vaccines, and infusions. Hasn't been very successful. There's been research looking at this anti-inflammatory hypothesis, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Even intranasal insulin spray, because if people get diabetes, that doubles their risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, we have a cannabis research initiative at UCLA, and uh, I want to understand how do cannabis ingredients either help or hinder cognitive function, and uh, we need to get more information on seniors about that. And we're also doing a study looking at low-intensity focused ultrasound, where we point ultrasound waves at the hippocampus memory center to try to jumpstart the neural circuits. With Alzheimer's drug development, there's been considerable investment over the last few decades and only modest results. Only four approved drugs, but over 100 drug failures because the drugs are not effective or they have side effects or they're targeting the wrong mechanism or they're testing these drugs in advanced disease. And I've always been someone who's advocated against that to try to test it early and to look at other hypotheses like the inflammatory hypothesis. This is a study we did a few years ago, uh, supported by NIH, where we looked at people who didn't have dementia, but had normal aging or mild cognitive impairment. And we found when we gave them 
an anti-inflammatory drug for 18 months, they had better cognitive function and their brain function looked better in the frontal lobe. Just an example of one of those studies. So if you do nothing, it's going to get worse. What we try to do is intervene as early as possible. Unfortunately, most doctors do little too late, but it's easier to protect a healthy brain rather than try to repair damage once it's extensive. So I mentioned those symptomatic treatments a moment ago. A lot of the research is focusing on what we call disease modifying treatments. So we could change that slope of decline and if the patient stopped the medicine, they would have a sustained effect. One way of thinking about it is if you had pneumonia and you took an aspirin, that would be a symptomatic treatment. It would temporarily help you with the symptoms, but you wouldn't be able to cure that pneumonia unless you took the right antibiotic. A lot of people take supplements, uh, but I warn people to proceed with caution. It's a multi-billion dollar business, but most claims are not confirmed by double-blind placebo-controlled studies, which really tells us whether the supplement works or not. And remember, just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. So go to reliable sources of information like uh, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, or AARP's Global Council on Brain Health. Uh, in the book, we talk about some of the popular supplements and uh, talk about the level of evidence for many of them. Uh, and you know, each of the ones I've listed here have some evidence and so, to some degree, except for the last one, Prevagen. Uh, looking at the data there, it's, it's really very limited evidence that uh, there's an effect from double-blind placebo-controlled studies, despite its popularity. We've been studying supplements and uh, nutritional uh, ingredients to see how they affect memory, and we use the double-blind placebo-controlled method, and uh, we've looked at pomegranate juice, where we found some effect over 12 months. Uh, I'm going to show you just something from curcumin that we've studied, because it had a very strong effect after 18 months. And uh, here you can see the data from that. Uh, and we saw a very strong effect of the curcumin for memory that began after six months and continued. And this was a certain product we got from a Japanese company called Thera Kerman. And uh, the limitation of that study was a small study. So we're planning this year to uh, do a replication study in a very large number of people. It will be. Uh, organizing it at UCLA and we'll have half a dozen sites in North America and Asia. We also talk about in this book, uh, lifestyle habits, because everybody's concerned about it. And we know that genetics don't account for all of the risk and physical and mental exercise, stress management, nutrition, social engagement, adequate sleep, all of these are very important to protect our brain. Physical exercise, I always try to talk about first because we have the most data on it. If you exercise, you will increase your brain size, you'll increase BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which gets your nerve cells in the brain to sprout branches and accumulate, excuse me, and communicate more effectively. It will lower your dem dementia risk and improve your cognitive function. And both aerobic and strength training seem to benefit brain health. In uh, people who are aging, who are um, isolating or uh, socially isolating and have to stay at home, can't get outside, they can exercise in, inside and be innovative about it. And there are lots of interesting websites that are helpful that will tell us how to do that. Arthur Kramer at the University of Illinois has done a lot of studies on aerobic exercise and he's put middle-aged and older people on walking programs where they walk about a half hour a day briskly and the control group just stretches and tones. So you can see the walkers, their hippocampi grew over six months and 12 months, but the non-aerobic group, the stretchers and toners, their hippocampi shrunk. And we know that a bigger brain is a better brain. So just remember, if somebody calls you a fathead, it's actually a compliment. Mental exercise is good. We want to stimulate our neural circuits. 
A lot of research showing a connection there. Educational achievement, bilingualism are associated with lower risk for dementia. But above and beyond that, there are memory training methods that will improve your memory very quickly and can maintain higher performance for years if you use them. I'm going to show you them in just a moment. But first, I want to mention that our UCLA Longevity Center has developed many of these programs. We teach them uh, at UCLA and across the country. We're in 160 sites. Uh, we have different kinds of courses. Most of them are for people with just normal aging, but we have a memory care program for people with mild dementia and their caregivers. Uh, and what we're doing very rapidly in this coronavirus environment is changing our program so we can teach them virtually. And I'm, I really applaud the Longevity Center staff for being able to do this so well. If you search online UCLA Longevity Center, you can learn more about them. And what we find when we train memory, if we look at a, a functional MRI scan, which shows you how our neural circuits are working, if you look at the upper scan, this is a woman before she learned the memory techniques, and you see a lot of red in her brain, which indicates her brain is working really hard to remember. Two weeks later, after she had taken the memory training, her memory improved dramatically, and look how little her brain is working. So you develop cognitive efficiency. You can learn, lift more weight, so to speak, and do less, exert less energy. And we teach simple techniques like look, snap, connect. Look is a reminder to focus your attention. The biggest reason people don't remember is they're simply distracted. Snap is a reminder to create a mental snapshot. The, the snapshots take advantage of the brain's natural ability to remember visually. And connect is a reminder to link up those snapshots so they have meaning. If something is meaningful, it will be memorable. So if you meet Mr. Baldwin, notice he has a bald head and imagine him winning at cards, Baldwin. Franny is easy to remember. Uh, she has freckles, that makes her name memorable. If you meet Mrs. Bangle, you can notice her bangs, that reminds you of her last name. And then in the course of the conversation, she tells you she's an attorney and that helps you remember her first name. If you park your car in lot 3B, just see three large Bs hovering over your car. Uh, if you park in lot 2B, see William Shakespeare standing on your car reciting to be or not to be. Now, does that mean your car is to be or not to be in lot 2B? That might not be the best example, but trust me, once you start learning these techniques, it's like a language and it becomes shorthand and very easy. Now, whether you're learning a language or learning memory techniques, it is activating your neural circuits. And a question people often ask, what happens to our brain when we search online? It's a very common mental exercise. And so we did a study on that. We called your brain on Google. And we recruited older people who had never searched online. And uh, that was the hardest part of the study. I, I knew uh, after a while, I found out I couldn't recruit them online. But we found them through flyers and newspapers, and we put them in an MRI scanner. They wore these special goggles, and so we could have them search online while they were in the scanner. And this is what we found. In the control condition, when they were reading a book, their brains weren't active that much. The activity is indicated by the red areas. When they searched online, their brains were having a party. There was a greater than twofold increase in activity. So, one conclusion from that study is that searching online can be a form of brain exercise. And there are other computer games that we talk about in the book that can train intelligence and working memory. Uh, there are games, uh, race, racing games that can improve your multitasking skills. And surgeons who play video games make fewer errors in the operating room. So the next time you have to have surgery, don't ask about where the doctor went to school. Find out how much that doctor is playing video. Stress is not good for the brain. It shrinks the brain. It causes memory impairment. Uh, in human studies, it increases dementia risk. But there are 
techniques to lower stress like meditation and relaxation exercises that not only lift mood, but improve memory and even alter your neural circuitry. Nutrition is important for your brain health. Uh, midlife obesity increases the risk for late life dementia. So you've got to watch your calories. Again, consume those omega-3 fats. They're anti-inflammatory. Eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, vegetables which fight oxidative stress, which is uh, not good for the brain. And try to minimize those processed foods and refined sugars, which can increase your risk for diabetes, which can double your risk for dementia. But diet is a challenge. If you look at evolution and body weight, it looks something like this. But the good news is studies looking at obese people who have undergone bariat bariatric surgery for weight loss show that they have significant memory improvements after 12 weeks. And newer studies show you don't even have to undergo the surgery to have memory improvement from losing weight. Some good news on the nutrition front. Uh, alcohol in moderation is associated with better brain health. Uh, we're not sure why it is. It could be that ingredients in the alcohol uh, help the brain, or it could be that uh, just having a glass of wine at dinner relaxes you. The one ingredient people have looked at is resveratrol, which is anti-aging in the laboratory. The, the scientists have, have uh, extracted it from grapes and wine, but it may not get through the blood-brain barrier. So if you're taking resveratrol capsules, make sure you wash them down with a nice Bordeaux to be on the safe side. Uh, alcohol uh, in moderation, as well as caffeine, and cough, coffee uh, in moderation is associated with better brain. Try to avoid hitting your head. If you smoke, quit. Have a positive outlook. It's infectious and it protects your brain and extends your life expectancy. If you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol, take your medicine. It will protect your brain health. People often ask, can we prevent Alzheimer's disease uh, with these kinds of strategies? If you equate the word prevention with cure, the answer is goal. The answer is no. But if you take on a more modest goal of delaying onset and slowing progression, the answer is yes. And it looks something like this. With no intervention, you're going to go downhill. At some point, you develop dementia. If you engage in these prevention strategies, you can delay the onset of dementia by years. And scientists have modeled this, and they look at these kinds of risk factors and prevention factors, and they estimate that up to one half of Alzheimer cases worldwide are potentially attributable to these kinds of factors. But it's hard to help people change. You've got to educate them, which we're doing today, making a connection between lifestyle and disease prevention. You've got to have programs that are fun and easy. And you've got to be able to see results to motivate you. It's pretty much like sitting, uh, going on a diet and getting on the, the scale and you see you've lost a couple of pounds that motivates you to continue. So let's try to motivate all of you. Let's see how well your memory has improved today. Uh, can you remember this gentleman's name? That's right, Mr. Baldwin. And this of course is Franny. And those of you, uh, particularly those of you who have been sued, will probably have an emotional memory and remember Sue Bangles' name. So let me just uh, summarize a few points and uh, get us, give us a chance to get to some questions. We've uh, learned a lot about Alzheimer's disease, uh, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, we have treatments. We have better ways to diagnose it. We have strategies for caregiving that helps reduce the stress. We have research that's ongoing. Unfortunately, we don't have a magic bullet. We don't have a disease modifying treatment. I'm optimistic we'll get there uh, soon in the future. But in the meantime, there are a lot of strategies that we can engage in to keep our brains healthy. And when, when uh, patients and families visit me, I often encourage them to engage in these healthy lifestyle habits together. So take walks together, uh, that can be very helpful.
Uh, for more information, you can uh, reach me on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, the Longevity Center website, uh, the Semmel Institute website I didn't uh, put there, uh, my book website. But, you know, actually, uh, just search online for any of these key words. Not only will you find us, but it will be a form of brain exercise. I also want to point out during the Q&A, there may be some specific questions about uh, the coronavirus epidemic, uh, anything that is technical that's outside my area of expertise, I would refer you to the UCLA Health uh, front page website. They have a lot of useful information. there. So let's now uh, see if we can open this up to questions and answers. This is, uh, okay. What I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to begin with a few questions that came in uh, before the seminar started and try to get through those quickly and then get through some of the other ones that have come through uh, during the presentation. First question is, at what age do I start to need to be aware of Alzheimer's? If my mother died of dementia, will I die of dementia? Uh, how do I test for that? You know, do I get an MRI? This person will be 75. And every time this individual forgets something, uh, that person thinks they have dementia. Any suggestions? Well, first of all, uh, you know, worrying about memory makes your memory worse. So try to get accurate information about it, and that's one reason you've tuned in today. Uh, you know, family history is important. If you have a family history of dementia, that does increase your risk to a certain degree, and the age at onset tends to be consistent in families. So if you're, if you had a, a grant, if you had a parent who got dementia at age 85 and you're 45 and you're worried about your forgetfulness, it really has nothing to do with dementia. It could be something else. It could be stress and so forth. In terms of what the tests will be, I, I went over that during the lecture. Chances are there would be an MRI scan. There may or may not be a PET scan unless the doctor wants to differentiate uh, frontal temporal dementia from Alzheimer type dementia. Next question, would you mind con commenting on Dr. Dale Bredesen's uh, view on preventing and reversing cognitive decline. Is this really possible in dementia? Well, Dr. Bredesen has wrote, written a popular book and he has some interesting theories and he makes some suggestions that uh, many of us agree with, you know, exercise, proper sleep and so forth. Uh, but a, a lot of the stuff he says, he talks about in his program has not quite been vetted using that scientific method that is the gold standard, and that is double-blind placebo-controlled studies. So, you know, I think that the evidence is still not completely in, in terms of his program. Uh, one person asked about uh, untreated and undiagnosed sleep apnea. This is a very common problem. Uh, in, of course, if you uh, know someone who snores or you know you snore yourself, you could be at risk. It would be important to talk with your doctor and see a sleep specialist, uh, and there are treatments available for that. Question was, can medication for depression cause false dementia? That used to be more of a case years ago when the, the medications we used were older medicines like uh, Elevil or Amitriptyline or uh, Norpramin or Dizipramine. Those medicines had what we call an anticholinergic effect, uh, which is the same kind of effect you see in those over-the-counter sleep medicines I mentioned, and in some antihistamines. The uh, medicines for Alzheimer's disease are cholinergic medicines, the Aricept and the um, Exelon. So uh, yes, if you're taking one of those older medicines, it could worsen your dementia, not so much if you're taking the newer medicines, like the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And in fact, 
there have been a lot of meta-analyses or studies on this, and they find that for many people who take these medicines, it actually can improve cognitive function. Because we all know if we're depressed or anxious, that's going to distract us, and it's going to be harder to remember information. Um, let's see, there's, uh, I think some of these questions I've already answered. Okay, what form of specific exercise should I do? Uh, well, here's what I generally recommend uh, to my patients uh, and to my friends and family. Actually, anyone who will listen to me, I'll probably recommend this. And that is to try to get some aerobic exercise every day. If you can, take a brisk walk. And in fact, uh, I talk about the triple threat to Alzheimer's disease. Take a walk with a friend. Uh, you're going to get the aerobic exercise will get your heart pump oxygen and nutrients to your brain cells. You're going to feel more relaxed because of the endorphins, the, those natural antidepressants in your body. Uh, the exercise with a friend means you can talk with your friend. And uh, at least one study found that an in-depth or actually just a stimulating conversation is good for your cognitive health. In fact, better than watching a television program. And finally, if your friend is empathic, that will reduce your stress level. So aerobic exercise is great. Strength training is important. Uh, and that seems to have additional benefits above and beyond aerobic training. And then the other one I recommend, particularly for older people, is some kind of balance training because uh, falls are so common. And if you fall, it's really going to set you back uh, with different fractures, having to be in bed rest and so forth. So how should one prepare if their parents had dementia or Alzheimer's? For example, should you see a neurologist or just be examined regularly? Uh, what to eat, meds, supplements? I sort of dealt with the latter there. You know, the, the kind of doctor to see in part depends on the availability of a specialist. We don't have enough specialists to go around. Often primary care doctors is the first place to start because of that. Many of them can handle it. If they feel uncomfortable about it, they can refer you out. If you have Parkinson's disease or uh, some neurologic condition uh, that might increase your risk for dementia, a neurologist would probably be more appropriate than, say, a geriatric psychiatrist, where if depression is an issue, that might be a bit more appropriate. And again, see the doctor sooner rather than later, because the, I can help people much more when they're in the early stages. So does a lifestyle of irregular sleep contribute to the likelihood of disease? But, you know, I think that a lot of people are concerned about their past lifestyle, what they've done, and they want to start over. You know, it, at any stage in life, if you can start being good to your brain, that's going to serve you. And, you know, our brains and our bodies have a tendency to recover of, uh, from all the abuse we've subjected it, subjected them to over the years. And, and clearly, sleep is very important. Studies have found that if you don't get adequate sleep, you get, have more amyloid in your brain, there's more inflammation in your brain. And if you get a good night's sleep, you're more alert. It really makes a huge difference. So I recommend that you do whatever you can to get better sleep. Um, let me see some of the, we've got some questions here. Am I taking daily meds like ibuprofen, Nexium? Well, melatonin and Ambien. Melatonin, I don't think is going to be harmful. Ambien, it's somewhat controversial. I mean, you can uh, certainly get a better night's sleep from Ambien. The question is, is it as restful a sleep as you can get uh, from using natural measures? Uh, ibuprofen, uh, people uh, take that for their aches and pains. Uh, the medicine we studied was uh, Celebrex or Celecoxib, uh, which is a, a similar kind of uh, anti-inflammatory medicine. I would suspect that any kind of non anti-inflammatory drug, whether it's ibuprofen uh, or naproxen, uh, may be brain protective, but we don't generally recommend it because it, they have side effects. And some studies have found that when people have more advanced cognitive impairment, that these medicines could actually accelerate 
uh, brain aging. And we don't have, we don't know that tipping point uh, when that occurs. Uh, let's see if I can get some other questions here. We really, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So uh, I'm having a little trouble accessing the rest of the questions. So uh, this is really a good brain, brain exercise for me. Um, okay, here we go, now I've got it. Can you post the medication list once again? Uh, we can, you know, uh, we can do that. You know, I would, th these kinds of medication lists, uh, you can, get almost anywhere. And certainly it's it's in the book if you want to take a look at that. Um, and you can get that information online quite readily. Uh, here's another question. I think I answered that one. Uh, question about transcranial light therapy. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of innovative approaches. I tend, when it comes to science, I tend to be agnostic. I think it's important to, to search these uh, different opportunities, but to not make premature conclusions about whether they work or not. Now I see that it's almost uh, 5 p.m. In, in California. And so I wanna be respectful of everybody's time and not go over. And I know that um, uh, Vicki, Goodman from uh, the Friends of the Semmel Institute wanted to make a few closing remarks. I, I really appreciate uh, your attendance, uh, your, your wonderful questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, we can try after the seminar to, tr to try to answer some of the ones we didn't get to. Uh, but again, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you get a chance, take a look at the book. I think you'll enjoy it and uh, let me, Turn it over uh, to. Thank you, Gary, for sharing your vast knowledge and expertise with our open mind audience. Your tips and all your information are just invaluable. And we're very, very grateful to you and to the UCLA Longevity Center for uh, the work that you do to benefit patients who live with Alzheimer's and their caregivers, loved ones, and families. Um, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Our next Open Mind program will be on Tuesday, May 19th, when we welcome Dr. Robert Bilder, who's a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences and psychology at UCLA. And his topic will be on being together six feet apart. So I hope you'll all join us. The link is on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. You'll also receive a thank you note tomorrow. So the link will be there as well. Um, have, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you very soon, either virtually or hopefully soon in person. Thank you so much for being here. Beep.